Guys, welcome to the J. Scott Outdoors podcast. Today, we're going to uh, be listening to a little bit of a remix of a coos deer field judging uh, podcast that I did in years past. I had a few guys send me a message on my Instagram asking for uh, to hear it again, so I'm going to replay it. Uh, for all you coos deer hunters that are going into the coos deer woods here uh, today and tomorrow for the Arizona opener, uh, the end of October. A couple things I've, that come to mind are uh, it is a new moon, so it's a dark moon. Uh, you should have pretty good activity uh, during the day. Um, like I've talked about on this podcast and on this in, on my Instagram uh, page, uh, make sure that you're glassing into the shade. So after about the first hour of light, you want to put all of your attention for the whole rest of the day into the shady pocket. So you're going to be wanting to glass into the north-facing slopes, the east-facing slopes, the northeast-facing slopes. Uh, you're going to want to find that those um, pockets, those bowls, uh, those hillsides that are thicker in vegetation uh, with mesquite, with oak, uh, and just a lot brushier. The, the coos deer bucks uh, during October and November hunts, because it's still warm, and on into December and even January, if it's warm, they're going to seek um, shade right away. So within 30 minutes to an hour after first light, uh, you can expect to find more deer in the shady pockets. Uh, guys, I want to thank you guys for listening to this podcast. I want to wish you the best of success uh, over the next month on these different coos deer hunts. Uh, if you guys have any questions of me, you can email me at jscottoutdoors at gmail.com. You can also send a direct message to me on Instagram, uh, on my Instagram account, at jscottoutdoors. I also want to thank the sponsors of this podcast. I want to thank my friend Cody Nelson over at Go Hunt. He's the optics manager. If you guys are looking for any upgrade, want to buy any new binoculars, spotting scopes, rifle scopes, tripods, anything to do with glassing uh, and optics, give Cody a call at 702-847-8747. That's extension 2. You can also email him directly at optics at gohunt.com. Make sure to mention my name. He's going to give you a really good deal, and I appreciate Go Hunt support. I also want to let you know that uh, the Go Hunt Insider uh, they are about to shut off their free trial. If you'd like to take a 30-day free trial, you can go to gohunt.com forward slash jscott and follow the prompts to get the 30-day uh, free trial. Uh, guys, Kuyu Ultralight Hunting, that's the gear that I wear on all of my hunts. Uh, you can uh, I answer a lot of questions on my Instagram account about Kuyu gear. If you have any questions at all, please uh, get a hold of me. Uh, go to kuyu.com, K-U-I-U, K-U-I-U.com. Uh, to find out more about Kuyu Ultralight Hunting, uh, you, it's a direct-to-consumer website. So the only place you can get Kuyu gear is to go to Kuyu.com. Love it. Great gear. Best gear on the market. Uh, also, Phonescope.com. Guys, use the JScott19 promo code. You're going to get a 20%, excuse me, a 10% discount there at Phonescope. Uh, and Phonescope.com, that's Phonescope with a K. And then onxmaps.com, guys, uh, if you use the jscott19 promo code when you sign up for Onyx Maps, uh, they're going to give you a 20% discount. Now, uh, a lot of people email me and say, Jay, I didn't get the discount. Well, Onyx, as soon as you sign up, they send you an email and they ask you for a promo code and just put in jscott19 all one word, and you're going to get that 20% discount. I use Onyx Maps literally every day, hunting, fishing, and in my real estate business. Um, I love to be able to switch back and forth between the topo, the aerial, and the hybrid mode. Uh, it's got a line distance measuring tool. You can literally have a buck across from you and measure the distance right on your Onyx map. Uh, you can share and send waypoints and tracks and uh, lines and, and locations. It's, it's just an awesome tool. Guys, I hope you enjoy this episode. I uh, hope this refines your field judging tactics. Uh, and if you guys have any questions, feel free to reach out. God bless. 
Guys, welcome to the J. Scott Outdoors podcast. Today we're going to be talking about uh, coos deer and field judging and scoring coos deer. And tomorrow is Friday, December 11th. And across the state of Arizona, the December tags uh, all kick off. And uh, the December tags are known as uh, rut hunts. And I would say that the last five days of the December hunts, uh, it's common to see uh, rutting activity. Um, I know that this weekend we're scheduled to have a cold snap come in. And uh, uh, more than anything, I think cooler weather uh, provides uh, for better environment for deer to be active and and moving around. Um, I also think uh, moon has something to do with it. Uh, it's going to be a dark moon. We're in a dark moon phase right now. So wouldn't be surprised if this weekend uh, the people that have December tags across Arizona are going to have a pretty darn good uh, atmosphere to uh, find some bucks. Uh, I wanted to go over, I've had uh, quite a few requests for uh, coos deer field judging and I've had great response to uh, a couple of the other uh, coos deer tactics um, episodes that I've done. And um, actually, you're going to have me alone uh, on this episode. I just figured it was a lot of information that I needed to get out there. And um, uh, so I'm going to, you're just, you're stuck with me, guys. Um, but we're going to go through. Uh, I've been working on an article uh, for gohunt.com. Uh, for judging coos deer and um, so we'll just dive into it and after this episode uh, if you've listened to it and you have questions uh, please feel free to email me at jscottoutdoors at gmail.com I'll do my best to answer your question the best that I could Um, I recently just got an email from uh, a fellow uh, J. Scott Outdoors podcast listener who is um, got a December tag in his pocket, and um, one of the questions that he asked me uh, is he has um, a, a December coos deer tag. He says, I've been listening to your podcast. Uh, it's one of my favorite things to listen to when I'm on the road. I'm leaving to chase coos deer for the first time and wondering if you have uh, some idea on what gear to bring Um I've got my outdoorsman's tripod and panhead Swarovski 8x42s, uh, Swarovski 12x50s, and a, and a Swarovski ATX95. Uh, would you leave the 8x42s at home and just use the 1250s? One of my buddies has the new SLC 15x56 and said he, I could use them. Should I swap them out for my 12s or am I just fine with the 1250s? Um, it's a great question and I get it a lot. Uh, I would say wear the eight power binoculars around your neck. Uh, I would uh, stick with the 12 by 50 binocular by Swarovski as the, the mounted binocular that you're going to use on your outdoorsman's tripod. Uh, I do have both the 1250 and the 15 by 56 and I absolutely love them both. If it is your first time chasing coos deer i think your field of view is going to be better with the 1250s so i think in this particular case uh 1250s you're going to pick up a few more deer uh that maybe you wouldn't with the extra three power on the uh, 15 by 56 Uh, i think if if uh this gentleman was a, a way more advanced expert coos deer hunter uh i think that extra three power is uh pretty sweet at times Um, you know, when depends on the terrain that I'm hunting, um, if it's real detailed, uh, glassing, the extra three power is great. Uh, if it's a lot of panning, uh, then I like that wider field of view with the 1250s. And then, uh, with his spotting scope in my mind, the Swarovski, uh, 95 millimeter, uh, with the uh, 30 to 70, uh, ocular lens, um, with the 95 millimeter objective, uh, I have not looked through a better spotting scope. Originally, I got the ATX um, and just couldn't get used to the angled eyepiece. I, I got the angled because I was using it for a lot of digiscoping and ended up switching the ATX out for the STX. Uh, the straight uh, angled is ATX and straight is STX. 
um, and have had uh, great success digiscoping with the TLS APO adapter made by Swarovski and my Canon SL1 camera uh, body. Um, on the STX, the straight 95 millimeter, there is not a finer spotting scope in my mind than than that one that uh, the 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 uh, guy that wrote in the uh, question is asking about. Uh, phenomenal spotting scope, uh, guys. Let's get right to the meat of uh, this uh, article, and uh, I look forward to hearing from you guys. Uh, I know a lot of. Uh, uh, Guys that are listeners have emailed that they there's a bunch of December tags in, in your pocket. So uh, go out there and enjoy it. Have a great time. Be patient. Um, don't expect a lot of rutting activity uh, until after Christmas, usually the last five days, but more specifically the last two or three days, usually you get quite a bit of rut. Um, if you're hunting in central Arizona units, you may get it around, uh, you know, maybe a little bit right before Christmas. Uh, seems like the further south you go, uh, the later the rut is. So uh, let's get right into it. As a hunter and outfitter, in my mind, there's nothing more fun uh, to hunt than big coos deer bucks. Uh, coos deer can be very exciting animals to hunt because of their wary nature and ghost-like qualities. I've been fortunate to, to have harvested and been involved with uh, many record book uh, animals, uh, coos deer bucks being harvested. Uh, my partner Dar Colburn of Colburn and Scott Outfitters and I use two methods to field judge coos bucks. First is the estimating actual measurements and the estimated shortest points. And if you guys uh, have listened to my elk field judging, I believe it's episode 50 and 51. Uh, it's a very similar method there. Hopefully these two methods will help your field judging for the upcoming season. Uh, please review the the charts, which we're going to go over here verbally, guys, um, to get a feel for the numbers. We often use certain size bucks. Uh, these numbers are instrumental for quick field judging. One of the things that's helped my field judging, guys, the most is actually measuring with the tape every antler I can get my hands on. Uh, the minimum net score in order to qualify for Boone and Crockett uh, record book is 110 for typical bucks and 120 for non-typical. Um, let's dive right into estimating actual measurements. There are four aspects or categories that are important while field judging and trying to determine a coos buck score. In, in the order of importance, in my mind, they are point length, main beam, length, mass, and inside spread. Um, point length, main beam length, mass and inside spread. The first and most important aspect to look for is point length. In my mind, you have to have long points in order to have a record book buck. Long points are mandatory in order for a buck to reach the record book. The second most important aspect is length of main beams. A buck must have a good main beam in order to score high. Mass is the third most important aspect of a buck score, then the inside spread. You hear a lot of people talk about, oh man, the buck was really wide or the buck was narrow. When you, when you break down the amount of percentage per, uh, per um, category, point length, main beam, uh, mass, and inside spread, spread is the very least. Uh, I would rather someone say, hey, I've got a buck with very long points and long main beams and you've perked my interest. That, that's going to be a pretty good buck. Um, when looking for a buck that would qualify for Boone and Crockett record book, usually one category weakness can drop you below the required trophy book minimum. The inside spread in relation to percentage of total score is the least important aspect of a high scoring buck. I'm going to walk you through how Dara and I field judge and actually add up actual measurements on a buck. For our example, let's assume we are looking at a buck that's between 110 and 15 inches. Um, while field judging trophy bucks, the first thing that I look for are the number and length of points. I make sure that the buck has at least a G1, which is the eye guard, on each side. A G2, a G3, plus a main beam. Almost all record book bucks have at least three points on each side plus the main beam. By our Eastern Brothers count, they would be called eight-pointers. I quickly 
estimate and add points on each side, G1, which is the eye guard, G2, G3, and a G4, if available, from each side. I always like my score estimates to be low or on the conservative side, and some would argue that I'm too low. Um, I remember a buck last year in Mexico. Um, I had Dean Heitzelman with me, and we were looking at this buck, and I just just couldn't get the looks. I mean, I was looking right at him, um, but I just couldn't get him to be that big. And, um, you know, I told Dar, you know, it's like a 95, you know, maybe a hundred inch type buck. And the buck started out, he was probably eight or 900 yards away. And he turned out, he got pretty close to us at one point in time. And, um, you know, he had quite a bit of mass and the mass hid the length of the points. And, so I don't want to come across as, you know, I, I feel judge these bucks down to the inch because I, I very rarely, or I, excuse me, I very often miss these bucks. And, and um, but if, if, if I did do anything, I probably judge them a little bit on the low side, uh, just because I never want to walk up on something that I think is much bigger than it is. And it's happened. Um, so it's, it's burned me before. And maybe that's why I'm a little bit gun shy. Um, keep in mind when you get bucks that have G4s and G5s that are matching lengths, your score will grow dramatically. Uh, back to our example buck, the buck we are judging has a left side, has a 3 inch G1, an 8 inch G2, and a 7 inch G3 for a total of 18 inches of point length on the left side. Now let's, let's assume that the right side uh, matches, so you add the right side and the left side, so now we have 36 inches of total point length. Once I have totaled the point length, I remember that the number 36, the next thing I do is try and judge the main beam length on each side. Um, we're gonna go over a table in a minute to get average main beam lengths that I use in my model. For long main beams, they need to go away from the head. So when you're looking at the buck head on or from behind, they need to go away from the head so paralleling the ears and go out to the end of the ears and then wrap back towards one another. Typically main beams that almost touch in the front are a very good sign of long main beams. One thing I will tell you though when you're looking at a buck head on if it could be a narrow buck that's just main beams come and come close together but if you get a buck that goes away from his head paralleling his ears obviously above his ears and goes out to the tip of their ears and then comes back all the way back in and almost touches, you've got a really good main beam. Also look for lots of space between the G2 and G3, much like when we're talking about scoring elk is you want distance between those points. And if, the, if you're looking at it and it looks like the, the G2 and the G3 are very close together, that beam isn't going to be as long as you think it is. Uh, a short main beam will not wrap around as much and will have a straight out with not much more curved look to it. Make sure when trying to look for a long wrap around beams that the buck is not narrow in width. Sometimes they can wrap nicely but are narrow and it can be deceiving. I look for main beams on a record book deer to be at least 17 inches. For our example, the buck we are judging has 18 inch main beams on both sides for a total of 36 inches. Next, I add my point link total. So remember, we had 36 inches on my point link total. We have main beams of 36 inches, which is 72 inches. Then I look at the mass of a rack. There are four measurements per side that make up the total mass measurements. So you have eight total, but four per side. Again, I have some preset numbers that I plug into my model, and we're going to go over that in the chart. The mass per side generally varies between 11 and 16 inches. On a 3x3 three three buck or an 8 pointer, the mass is measured in four spots on each main beam between the burr of the main beam and the G1, between the G1 and G2, between the G3, or excuse me, G2 and G3, and then the halfway point between the G3 and the tip of the main beam. When you have a 4x4, four or a 10 pointer, you take the fourth mash measurement between the G3 and G4. Now, if you were to have a five by five, uh, you don't, you only get four mass measurements. So between the uh, G3 and the G4, uh, 
That would be the furthest out mass measurement you could take. Okay. So for our example, I then add my mass estimate of 13 per side, so 26 inches in with my other two totals. So remember we had uh, 36 and 36, okay? So that equals 72 plus 26, that is 98 inches. Now, so we have 98 inches and the next thing we have to do is add up the uh, spread credit. Once I have completed the estimate and addition of points, main beams, and mass, for example, our total is 98 inches so far. Then all I have to do is add the inside spread credit to the number. Inside spread is usually easy to estimate because I use the width of the ears to estimate the inside spread. The tip-to-tip -tip width of a buck's ears can vary a little but are usually between 15 and 16 inches. Most bucks racks lie within the ears. So then it's just a matter of estimating how much inside the ears the main beam lies. If it is one inch inside the ear on each side, then the spread is probably 13. So you have 15, the ear width is 15 minus two, an inch on each side, it's a 13 inch inside spread. Keep in mind, coos bucks are rarely outside their ears. It seems like we always hear guys talking about bucks that are outside their ears. I have seen very few bucks that main beams lie outside their ear width. I have seen it, but it is rare. So for our example, a 14-inch spread, you take 98 inches, which is points, main beam, and mass, plus, plus uh, 13 um, sorry here, I just said a 14 inch spread. Let's, it's a 13 inch spread. Uh, you've got 98 plus 13, you've got 111 inches gross. Hopefully that uh, example uh, was easy for you guys to follow. There's another way to quickly field judge a buck and that is one that we use when we're trying to judge the quickest. It also comes up with the net score, the uh, closest to the net score. It's a simple method. We start by estimating the shortest points. Compare each G1 and add the shortest one. Continue for each point measurement. Add the shortest main beam and throw in a number for mass out of the chart and double it, and then add spread. This method gives you a quickest way to estimate the buck's net score. It is very important to add the measurements in the same order every time. I always do points, main beam, mass, then double that number and add the inside spread. Once you do it several times in that order, it'll become habit. If you and your hunting partners use the same method in that order and it becomes easy to communicate and field judge while glassing a buck together, I can spout out measurements to my hunting partner Dar and he knows exactly which order we are in and we can come up with an estimation very, very quickly. Okay, for our example on this, uh, estimating shortest points, uh, let's take our example. G1, 3 inches. G2, 8 inches. G3, 7 inches. That's 18 inches. Okay? Main beam, 18 inches. Mass, 13 inches. So it's 18 plus 18 plus 13 times 2 is 98 inches. Then add the inside spread of 13. You get 111 inches. Okay, guys, I want to go over a couple charts here that are going to help you out. And I'm going to try and list these charts on my website, jscottoutdoors.com. Uh, so if you need to print them out, you can. Uh, th these charts are going to give you kind of average ballpark measurements for certain size bucks. For a 90-inch buck, you're looking at point length of a G1 of an inch, G2 of 6 inches, a G3 of 4 inches, which gives you a total point length per side of 11 inches. You've got main beams 15 to 16 inches per side and mass is 11 to 12 with an inside spread of 12. So that's gonna give you uh, a one for G1, a six for G2, a four uh, for G3, a 16 for main beam. Okay guys, that's gonna be a one plus a six plus a four plus a 16 plus a 12 equals 39. So one side equals 39 times two, that's 78 plus a 12 inch spread, that's a 90 inch buck. A 100 inch buck, points, G1 is two, G3 is seven, 
excuse me, G1 is 2, G2 is 7, G3 is 6, 15 inches. Main beam is going to be 16 to 17 inches with mass 12 to 13 per side with a spread credit of 13. That's going to give you 2 plus 7 plus 6 equals 15 plus 16 plus uh, 12 equals 43 on one side times 2. That's 86 plus a 13 inch spread. That's 99. For a 110 inch buck, you've got 3 inch G1, 8 inch G2, 7 inch G3 for a total of 18 inches of point length plus main beam of 17 plus mass of 13, a spread of 14. That's going to give you 18 plus 17 plus 13 equals 48 times 2. That's 96 plus 14 inch spread. That's 110. For a 115 to 120 buck, usually you're going to have a 4 inch G1, which is the eye guard, an 8 inch G2, an 8 inch G3, or 20 inches of point length, plus usually for a 115 to 120 buck, they're going to have an 18 to 19 inch main beam, mass is going to be 14 to 15, and your spread you're looking at probably 14 to 16. So that's a 4 plus an 8 plus an 8 plus a 14 plus an 18 equals 52 times 2, that's 104. Add in the 14 inch spread credit for 118. A 125 plus buck, you're normally going to have a 4 inch G1, 8 inch G2, 8 inch G3 for 20 inches of point length. Main beams, that's when you're getting a, those long main beams, 18 to 20 inches. Mass, you're getting a heavy, heavy buck that's 16 inches, so that's roughly 4 inches per mass measurement per side and a spread of 16. So the numbers are 4 plus 8 plus 8 plus 19 plus 16 equals 55 for one side times 2. That's 110 plus a 16 inch spread. That's a 126 inch buck. Guys, um, I want to go over a few random thoughts. I know this is a lot of information and I appreciate you guys kind of sticking with me here. Point length is the most important aspect of a buck score. I cannot grind that in enough. You have to have long points, points for a buck to be a big buck. So when you're glassing these bucks, look for long points. Uh, you, you, and you can have a freak wide buck or a freak heavy buck that you know will edge up and score, but consistently long points is everything. Main beam length is the second most important aspect of a buck score. In smaller bucks under 100, main beam actually is the highest percentage of score. So picture if you have little short dinky points, you know, their 15 inch main beam is going to be the highest percentage of the categories. But once you get up into, you know, the 95, 100 inch bucks, point length becomes everything. In order to have a record book buck, look for the magic number of point length of 20 or more. So if you're adding up a buck and he on one side he comes up with 20 inches, okay? You start adding up the buck and you're like, okay, he's got a 5 inch G1, he's got a 9 inch uh, G2, so you're at 14 and he's got an 8 inch G3, you're at 22, you're looking at a big buck. G2s are rarely more than 9 inches long. Now granted, uh, Brady Miller's you know, were 11 inches and he scored like 120. And yes, I've seen some 10 and 11 inch G2s, but rarely are they over 9 inches long. Uh, inside spread rarely exceeds 17 inches. Uh, main beams rarely exceed 20 inches. Uh, it's very rare for a buck to have over a 20 inch main beam. And, and Honestly, pretty dang long is 19 inch main beam. So when you're trying to estimate your score, don't ever throw in 20 inches because that's like as long as you could possibly have for a main beam. Uh, remember this, bucks without eye guards or G1s rarely make 110. Uh, a 110 buck, so a record Boone and Crockett record book buck usually has no weakness. 
Um, it is important to have long points in order for a buck to score 100 plus inches. Uh, if, if a point or main beam looks short, then it probably is. If a point or main beam has some curve to it, then it's probably longer than you think. If a point or main beam is straight, then it's shorter than what you think it is. You look for main beams that wrap around and come close together in the front, but make sure it's not a narrow buck. Look for the wide buck with wrapping main beams and long points. When you find that, you're going to have a big buck. Narrow bucks usually mean short beams. Uh, when the buck is facing broadside, look for lots of space between the points. This means a long main beam. Uh, if points look long, make sure that they are not light, antlered, little skinny points. If they are skinny with little mass, then they are probably not as long as you think. So my example before on that buck last year that fooled me, he had tons of mass throughout his whole rack, not only in the areas uh, where you take your circumference measurements, but all the points were heavy, and it kind of hid the length. On the contrary, if you have skinny points that look really long, they might not be as long as you think because of how skinny the rack is. So keep that in mind. Uh, if the points carry lots of mass, they will look shorter than they are. Uh, great bucks, antlers will look long and real high off their head. So when I see a 110 inch buck, he looks really big. And then when you get up in the 120, 130, their racks need to look almost ridiculous on their head. If you have to kind of squint and you don't see that big frame, it's probably not a record book deer. Extra points and kickers. Extra points and kickers. One thing about abnormal points is they will boost your score dramatically. If you get a couple extra points, you could get 4 to 6 to 8 to 10, 12 inches of extra. And you go from looking at what you think is a 110-inch buck, all of a sudden he's got 12 inches of extra and he turns out to be 122. So watch those bucks that have extra points. 4x4 uh, four four bucks, quite honestly, are pretty rare. Uh, most of the bucks are 3x3 three three with eye guards. Uh, when you get 4x4 four four, four four bucks, they usually score very well. Uh, generally, 110-inch bucks will have pot belly. Uh, they'll appear to have a bigger body than the smaller bucks. They'll have that real blocky shoulder and just be a mature looking. And you'll see the mass on their head. You'll see a lot of mass. Um, that's usually an indication of a 110-inch buck. Uh, 100-inch bucks tend to look... 100 inch plus bucks tend to look big on the hoof from any distance. If you see a 100 inch or plus, he's going to look like a big frame. You'll see the length. You'll see the mass starting to form. You'll see those beams. If, if you're looking even like at a mile away, if you don't get that real big look off the top of their head, it's probably not a 100 inch buck. Uh, and also 120 inch bucks, usually every one that I've seen, they look ridiculous on the, on the hoof. So they just pop off the top of the head and it just looks like a giant rack. Uh, fight the urge to say the buck was outside his ears because it's very, very rare and I hear it all the time. Outside spread usually means nothing or, or, or abs means absolutely nothing when it comes to Boone and Crockett's scoring system. Inside spread is the only credit that counts in Boone and Crockett. Here's a, a few discoveries according to the the Boone and Crockett record book. The top 10 typical bucks had an average main beam length of 20 inches. Conversely, 10 bucks just making the minimum of 110 had an average main beam length of 17.68 inch main beams. The top 10 non-typical bucks had an average main beam length of 18 and 5 eighths. Conversely, 10 bucks just making the minimum of 120 had an average main beam length of 17 and 7 eighths. So right there you can see that the top 10 non-typicals had 18 and 5 eighths and the, the bottom 10 that just barely made the minimum of 120 had 17 and 6 eighths. That's only 6 eighths inches of difference in spread credit. The top 10 typical bucks had an average inside spread of 15 and 3 eighths. 
Conversely, 10 bucks just making the minimum of 110 had an average inside spread of 15 and 18. So right there, there's only a 2 eighths inch difference between the, the highest typical bucks and the, the ones that just barely made Boone and Crockett on the uh, inside spread. The top 10 non-typical bucks had an in, average inside spread of 14 and 7 eighths. Conversely, 10 bucks just making the minimum of 120 had an average spread of 14. The widest inside spread recorded in Boone and Crockett is 21 inches. Okay, guys, I wanted to go over uh, real fast some anatomical references um, for you guys to use when you're judging coos deer. The front corner of the eye to the tip of the nose is usually six to six and a quarter inches. The V in the bottom of the ear to the tip of the ear is usually six to six and a half inches. So basically the ear is usually around six to six and a half inches. Ear width when looking at a deer at, that's relaxed is usually uh, 15 to 16 inches. Ear width to tip to tip when looking at a deer head on when he's alert is usually 14 to 14 and a half inches. The top of the ear to the bottom of the ear is 3.25 inches. And the tip of the nose to the back of the neck in a straight line is around 10 inches. I hope these anatomical um, references will help you out. Guys, I know we covered a lot of ground here and um, I just uh, hope that you're able to take in some of this information. Uh, I wish you the best out there. Uh, we're getting prepared for our Mexico coos deer hunts in January uh, during the rut. And I know a bunch of you are going down to Mexico. I'm going to be doing a few podcast episodes on uh, traveling in Mexico and, and some of the do's and don'ts and some of the things to remember when going down there. Uh, I just want to thank you guys for listening and uh, making this podcast uh, a success. I uh, appreciate all the support and the emails that I get from you guys. And uh, feel free to uh, send me a picture of uh, Buck. A coos deer that you kill this year either with your bow or with your rifle um, and uh, I love uh, getting pictures uh, from successful hunters I hope uh, some of these tips could be used to help you out and I love to hear from you you can email me at jscottoutdoors at gmail.com and I just appreciate all the support of this podcast